good we come back. <laughs> okay. This is the time for your questions and answers and, uh, and exploring, et cetera. So I'd like to start with just uh, about one minute of quiet so that, uh, you know, I used to be in a group and some people talked all the time, like me, and other people didn't talk ever. So <laughs> we did this funny thing. You got 10 pennies for the hour and a half meeting, and every time you talked, you put down a penny, and some of us ran out of pennies really fast. <laughs> But others were holding 10 pennies. And so it was just interesting to get aware of that. So let's take a minute. And even if you don't share your question, you don't ask it, it's good to know it and to hold it, to know your question about your practice, about Buddhism, or Bud without the ism. <laughs> so, uh, just take a minute and think about that. And if you're someone who went to um, the Mahamudra, perhaps you could think of a one or two minute highlight to share uh, about that with us. We're hoping for a, another longer time to hear about the trip, but since it's nice and fresh. So let's just have a moment of silence and each go inside and think where you're at with your practice and your questions. Okay, who would like to begin, Mary? And we will be passing the microphone around. That's for the streamers to hear the question. It's just, if it's okay, um, I was wondering if the people who went to India this year would just raise their hands so we can see who among us, if that's, if you don't mind, that is. Yeah, good, cool. So there's four. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mary, for asking. Heather, I was just going to say, I think I scared all the talkers away. <laughs> so that means the quiet people need to <laughs> be brave. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> so I have a question. I have recently realized I have a habit of dissociation. So I, um, my mind wanders so far to the point where I'm not aware of what's happening anymore. Hmm. And I guess I'm just curious about practices, things to do to help ground, to help, um, to help uh, myself learn to reassociate. 
what do you already know? Because you must be able to come back <laughs> because you'd still be out there. Eventually. <laughs> yeah, so what do you do? Um, part of it is being aware of my body um, and having something to help ground me. Yeah. Um, but I think my problem is it gets scary because sometimes I don't know when I'm doing it. Oh, okay. So... Yeah, okay. Huh. Yeah. So you, you, uh, if you, if you catch it, when you finally catch it, it's not an if, because you always, you might notice you always catch it at some point. Could be a long time, but you do catch it. Mm -hmm. That's important, because this sense of, uh, um, I'm really interested in what Mama Michael was talking about the, either the last Sunday he taught or the one before that. Um, this sense of confidence that we build and how he was going about that with very short sessions, you know. Um, and like this morning when I was before break saying, see where your mind is bring it back to the object. So we build a sense of confidence, I can do this. And then ending the uh, calm abiding session on that sense of confidence. Okay, that makes sense. Just like you're coaching anybody to do anything. You don't want to end on, well, that was the screw up. <laughs> so go off and feel bad. Um, that will not entice the person to come back. So uh, doing that in your calm abiding sessions, waiting till you notice and you come back, that will be building that muscle. Uh, on the body is really helpful. Just come back to the mindfulness of the body and What, what my experience is, is, uh, and I'd be happy to hear from others about this, is that uh, I start noticing where my, what my habit is. What is the thing that uh, happens before the disassociation? Would, I mean, disassociation is a big word for just m not mindful, you know, in a certain way just really not mindful, um, gone, kind of gone. I think most of us experience that in, in any session, like, wow, where was I, you know? Um, I've been gone for <laughs> 20 minutes on a story or a sort of sense of spaciness, you know, just floating. So always what I think is helpful is to feel a sense of confidence and rejoicing in, now I'm seeing it, now I'm back. That will build that. The body is really helpful. I mean, for me, one of my shticks is anxiety. So I now know it starts right here for me. There's a bodily sensation that may even precede the, the thoughts. So I go, oh, I'm getting good at it. Like, hey, that sensation is here. And go there instead of off to all the thoughts. And when I say go there, just like we put attention on the breath, we can put attention to that part of the body gently, precisely, and just it's almost like exploring it, but without questions. It's more like, hmm, yeah, I feel that. Yeah, that's all. Just, I feel that. Yeah. And then, um, nothing to be afraid of. You know, things come and go. Fear comes and goes. You could notice your fear comes and tells you something, maybe oh, this isn't good, or this will never end. Just notice those messages, let them go by. And fear also is impermanent. So, yeah. 
I was curious whether you were talking about particularly in formal session or outside. I wasn't sure. All the time. All the both then. <laughs> So I was thinking of just to a adding to that a couple of simple things. I find that the, um, the meditation technique of counting the breaths um, is very anchoring. So in the Mahmoud program, we do um, counting to 21. Um, you can count on the inhalation or the exhalation, but you know, just following each breath, but giving it a number, and uh, you know, going to 21, and that gives you some feedback too of did did I get completely lost during the 21, or did I actually kind of make it to 21 and then start over. Um, it's a, it's a pretty, it's like, you know, some of our techniques are very subtle and, and mm, ephemeral, you know, a little, a little, yeah, subtle, anyway, harder to, um, get a handle on, but this, this one is very hefty, I feel. Um, and similarly, during the day, um, using words, some words, uh, like it uh, could be a mantra, or it could be, um, you know, may all beings have happiness, or, you know, something um, to kind of have something to carry and repeat to yourself when, when you're doing things that make that, that, where it's possible, that that can be a thing to kind of tether the mind to, so, possibilities. It's also helpful um, to start to notice which activities or places uh, that's more apt to occur and go in kind of prepared with a mantra or, you know, like, like, okay, I know uh, when I see this person, I tend to lose my, uh, <laughs> I tend to get lost in the conversations, excitement or anger or whatever. So going in, I try and do, you know, more of a grounding to start and have some tool here that I'm gonna pull out. For me, it's like if I can catch myself in that, uh, lost, then I just, oh, that's the Buddha. I'm looking at them and I just say, oh, it's the Buddha. And then I'm just kind of waked up a little bit. I know they're, they're not, but it's like they're, whatever they're saying gets more interesting and I get grounded. So I'm not feeling like, gee, I have to respond and it's scary, you know. Yeah. So you'll figure out one of those for yourself. It is said that it takes about a year of intense study to really get shamatha. And um, if I already had shamatha, what's next? And if it's going to take a year of intense study, I'm probably never going to get there. So what do I, how do I feel as if I'm practicing productively? Uh, is there ever a time, Peter, that you do feel a sense of productivity, shall we say? It's an interesting word to use, but a sense of, uh, of peace and that it's useful to do it. Um, yeah, I guess I would say it the other way. Uh, say? It, is, it, it has always surprised me that the time I spend meditating has never seemed like it wasn't something worth doing. And okay. when I started uh, the way I am as a human being, I thought, 
I'll do this for two weeks, and I'll think, what am I wasting my time doing this for? And I did it for a year, and it didn't feel that way, and I've done it for longer than that, and I still don't feel that way. Okay. So you feel it's useful? Yeah. Um, I don't think about it often enough, but I have three reasons that I meditate. Oh, tell us. Because I think this is, you're answering your own question here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious. I do it because I have time to do it and other people don't. So I'm doing it for myself and them. Cool. Um, I do it because I've experienced the fact that it benefits me. And I've lost the third reason at the moment. Uh-huh. How does it benefit? Um, I've gotten much calmer. Uh, I'm a nicer person to be around, I think. And um, yeah, I get insights. Uh, to be really personal, my wife is hard of hearing. And from my childhood being neglected, I really uh, have an expectation that she'll be on edge, ready to listen to me and respond. <laughs> yeah. And I laugh because I do this too. Yeah. And and uh, one of the things that I say is that I will not uh, rigidly impose my idea of how things should be. And recently, and I think it's related to meditation, I began to think about the fact expecting her to respond to me the way I need her to is one way of uh, rigidly expecting the world to be the way I want it to be and uh, that I could do some thought about if I'm not going to rigidly impose that on here, what am I going to do instead? So I think meditation leads to those kinds of yeah. insights yeah. for me. Well, you know what the Dalai Lama says about the measure of your practice? So practice would include calm abiding, include like you have a bodhisattva attitude towards your calm abiding for others. So the measure of practice is are you a kinder person? Success. So let's go back. I mean, really, just rejoice in it. My goodness, what you just described, that's it. You know, so so let's go back to the first piece because um, I think I think many of us have too much expectation <laughs> and too much expectation of what Shine is, what's going to come next. Am I doing it? Can I do it? Do I have enough time? And. Uh, Pretty much all the teachings say uh, it's hard to gather the causes and conditions for success in Shine. So one of the causes and conditions is long solitude. Most of us don't have that. So expecting us to, you know, come to the pinnacle of calm abiding, which would be, let's say, put your focus on something for three hours without ever losing it, <laughs> you know. Um, that's not realistic. What, what keeps me uh, going and happy is I'll get as far as I can in this life. That will be carried in the mind stream. I mean, how did you come to Buddhism and calm abiding in this life? Some cause had to occur. You know, for me, I'm really clear I didn't create those causes in this life. I was wild, you know. Some, some kind being in the mind stream back there did, did the things that caused it. I mean, I also did some social service work, da da da. All those things go into it. We, can, we don't know. But, but the causes are solitude. The Dalai Lama says six months in solitude, close to a experienced teacher, you can, quote, I don't know, kind of get it down, but I would say 
make good progress, <laughs> you know, having been a year in a cabin trying to do this. Um, may, if you make some good progress, bow to it, <laughs> okay? Too high of expectations. Long as we're uh, lay people living in the world, a big part of our, uh, and it's wonderful, a big part of our practice will be off the cushion, being kind, noticing. Uh, you know, I don't need to impose my preferences on this situation. Seeing that, that's huge. That's such a kindness. Most of us are very, uh, Tim, uh, Tim Campbell, who helps lead the mind training, well, who does? I just pretty much assist him. He's always talking about don't, uh, don't impose yourself, don't insert yourself so much. You know how he's seeing that, like he steps in a room and he's already asserting his, this should be like this, or I'm going to jump in and make the conversation go here. And just noticing that, like, wow, we're so assertive. Who do we think we are? <laughs> Which is a key question. Who do we think we are? Okay? Thank you. Good enough. Thank you. So maybe uh, would some people from India be willing to share uh, a brief highlight for the good of us, so inspire us to go sometime? They've been stunned into silence. Or they're jet lagged, <laughs> or both. So lead your Great. You want to wait for the microphone for the streamers. Thanks. So uh, what I'm experiencing right now is this incredible fullness and awe and gratitude. And there's something about being here right now that uh, everything is um, everything is feels so um, full I, 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 and extraordinary and I I can't I won't be able to name something because it's like the, it's a big wave and I can't uh, dissect the wave but I, and I don't want to, yeah. that there's a, feels like there's a kind of an incubation time that needs to be, um, I need to be present with. I will say this is, uh, somebody was asking me about pictures this morning and uh, yet last night I found a, an app that we can, all of us can put our photos on and uh, so, my intention in this moment, and I hope it stays, is to um, make a slideshow so that everybody can participate from our photos and our memories. Thank you, and thank you so much for that piece about uh, when we come back from profound things, there definitely needs to be an incubation time, so thank you. Anybody else want to share just briefly a highlight or a thought? No, you don't have to. <laughs> well, I've been incubating on this for <laughs> 23 years, so, <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh, maybe I, I will put some things into words. Um, I'm really struck when I go um, to these um, seminars with our teachers that with a number of things. It's, it's um, like it adds dimension to what we already have here and it 
there's an emphasis on some different qualities that we may, you know, something we might do. It's more subtle here, and it's more um, played up there. And so things are just, um, it's all there, and it's all here, but it's in different amounts. Um, and one thing that is striking, I think, is the, the sense of lineage and uh, lineage connection. And that gets reinforced in a, a number of ways. And one is just uh, seeing someone like uh, <coughs> Campo Lodre Dunya Rinpoche, who has, you know, from a young age, devoted his life completely to the Dharma, to training himself, to or being trained, and to following his teacher very closely, staying by Boko Rinpoche's side pretty much every minute of every day for years on end until Boko Rinpoche passed away, and then assuming, taking the duties that he needed to take over after Boko Rinpoche died, and now we see him training the young Boko Rinpoche who will hopefully become um, a good teacher in his time. And so just seeing how we see that in front of us, how it, how it works. And it's not that we don't have lineage here, but it's just not as maybe as visible. And, and seeing how also the, how the monastery, um, so there were a few monks there with Rebuche, and then a few more came later on, and just seeing how they, you know, and with their giving their lives in that way, um, how they support Rinpoche's activities, and they support all of us. Um, I'm also struck by uh, Sangha, and it's an incredible international Sangha that we're part of. Um, these seminars started 25 years ago, so this was a big deal. This year, Kim Rinpoche made a big thing out of the fact that this is the 25th anniversary of the seminars. And so he tried to do a lot of, you know, or did do um, a lot of special things uh, for us and with us. But uh, one of the things then, in one of the ceremonies, uh, gifts, special gifts were given to uh, it was it there were 16, so 16 people who were there who had been coming since that, um, you know, who were also here at that first seminar 25 years ago. And so, you know, they're even grayer than, <laughs> than me. And, and they made this huge trip to India once again and so many times uh, in between. And, and there's a real sense of, community amongst the participants and, and also with Kempo Rinpoche. Um, it's a very kind of a family feeling. And because KCC is a big component of the, um, the English speaking side, I mean there's a lot of French speaking people, but of the English speakers we had almost 15 of KCC and affiliated, or maybe 16, anyway. Um, and people were aware of that, and Kim Prabhupada mentioned us, and, you know, mentioned Lama Michael and our retreat, and, you know, and how happy he is with all the work that we've done and the connections over the years, and recognizing that, you know, Bill and Dora come all this time, and recognizing that Lama Eric you know, started here and has been so helpful and continues to be. So there is a sense of, and we're similarly aware of the French, you know, kind of their counterparts doing this too. And so there's just a huge web of connection and it goes all over the world and it goes through time and, you know, and Kim Rinpoche isn't even the one who started the seminars. Boker Rinpoche started them, but they continue and they, you know, so you, it, it's, it, it's a way to see um, this kind of connection and, and the support that we all get from it and how it helps us to do our practice. And, um, and it's enjoyable too. It's just great to see you know, our friends from Australia who we 
see every year or every other year or every few years um, over the 23 years that Bill and I have been um, going to the seminar. So, yeah, those are, there's many other things, but those are some of the things that stand out for me. Bill, do you want to share today? <laughs> Good. The, the seminars always have uh, some, some interesting piece. When, when we've done the Mahamudra seminars here, it's been, we've tried to be very organized and do the same thing. But um, this year, one of the, we didn't, it wasn't planned to work out this way, but it did, uh, is that the Dalai Lama decided to come to Bodh Gaya mm -hmm. at the same time that Kemper Rinpoche was offering the seminar. Mm -hmm. So there were opportunities to see uh, His Holiness, and uh, we saw His Holiness on uh, a couple of occasions, and that actually one of the sessions of the seminar was, uh, Kemper Rinpoche said, well, I think uh, it would be good, since His Holiness is offering generous empowerment, that we all go and do that. So we did that along with, I don't know, 20, 30, maybe 40,000 other people. Um, <laughs> a small group. A small group. Um, <laughs> And we did have we did have a chance to see His Holiness in a in a more uh, just very a very brief uh, more intimate um, all our 160 or so people with a photo uh, group photo with His Holiness on another day, um, and uh, at the the Mahabodhi Stupa uh, is the site where a number of uh, a number of different traditions will have big prayer festivals so that um, they'll come together for days and weeks and be reciting prayers, and one of them was going on at the same time. So when they were in session, it was pedestrian gridlock inside, <laughs> and then the Dalai Lama would come, and I think, Sarah, didn't you get stuck in like a two-hour traffic, pedestrian traffic jam? <laughs> Yeah, with, with uh, sort of more or less close to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Oh, great. So, uh, Good karma. Yeah. With so, being stuck. <laughs> so called. Stuck with His Holiness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stuck with um, His Holiness for two hours. <laughs> what a blessing, my yeah. gosh. So there, uh, every year there's, there's something. And this year that was one of the somethings. So. Great. So, you know... Uh, as we listen, a couple things that we can recall to mind is uh, the immeasurable called sympathetic joy. So those of us who didn't get to go feel the sympathetic joy for those who did. It's amazing. And the second uh, thing about the teaching about rejoicing in someone else's merit their positive potential, their effort, is they say you get equal amount. So, yay, we're so glad you went. <laughs> we get it without having to do the jet lag and the, and the fog schmog and all that. So, so be, just have a very rejoicing heart. And due to interdependence, of course, we are a cause of these folks going and they're their positive potential. It's never individual, it just flows. So um, one of the ways we can get in the way of that flow is thoughts like, well, I didn't get to go, and they got to go. And so just dump all those and, and just really rejoice. It's the happiest kind of mind and the one that leads, leads your own mind to more positive potential, yeah? Something else, Bill? And along those lines, uh, the seminar has offered a chance for a kind of, um, hmm, the establishment of kind of a dynamic in this community. And it's not just people who have gone or go to <laughs> India who are in and then everybody is, is <laughs> else is out. Right. Because uh, <clears throat> it does flavor a lot of things. And one of the things that we'll be doing in the coming year is for the benefit of the people who went this year, but also people who have been part of the Mahamudra program over the years. We'll do some more programs to, uh, to support the practices, the actual practices that are involved in that, and that those will be open to other people as well. 
some some of the yeah. things about those practices. We'll, we'll have a chance to go into them in more more detail. Yes. The seminar can be very compressed, so we'll now have a chance to un let that unfold. And uh, another tendril will be Lama Eric will be here in the fall. Is it August or September? September in September and the three-year retreat land will be open because folks who are on retreat there will be out or coming out and um, so there will be a calm abiding uh, insight retreat with Lama Eric and uh, Chenresi, a shorter Chenresi weekend so look on the calendar and sign up now and clear off your work calendar and clear off for your family knows you're going to go do this because he's a gem and he lives there most of the time. So all of that, just like these folks bringing it back, will bring back even more of that flavor of the lineage that's there. So plan to join in. Yeah, others? Well, I, one of the interesting things, uh, and I was pretty touched by this, uh, one, on the one hand, when we go, we see like there's much more ritual pageantry <laughs> and all of this that goes on that's, you know, in, that our tradition has to offer, and we do less of it here. Um, and so we had a number of empowerments, and, you know, and so there's a lot of uh, chanting in Tibetan by Rinpoche and ringing bells and drums. and um, but um, a couple of things. One is that with Lama Eric, um, we had our earphones and our radios with his uh, translation, and so he took advantage of that. I mean, Rinpoche would explain things about an empowerment, and then they would be explained, but then also Lama Eric would go ahead and sort of translate as Rinpoche was um, doing this ritual. And so we had a... Mm -hmm more of a sense of it, you know, of how, what was actually happening. And then uh, one thing I was very touched by was um, we did, we collected names of people who had died, and we had two lists. One was a list of people from past seminars who have died, and then just a general list of anyone we wanted to put on uh, who had died, so many, many people. Um, and so there's a special prayers and practices to be done for that. And there are, of course, things we don't know and we didn't have any text we could recite with. Uh, but Kemper Moshe made a point of saying um, that he thought about it and he, you know, he could have had just he and his monks sort of do that somewhere. We could have just, mm -hmm. you know, given them offerings and had them do it. But he really thought it would be better that we do it together and that we were a part of it. So even though we couldn't chant it, um, just having us there, he felt was uh, meaningful and a contribution. And so that was very nice because it's easy to sometimes feel like, oh, you know, hand it over to the llamas to do this yeah. thing that we don't yeah. quite understand. But um, in this way, we were um, really a part of that and that the lists of, during the ceremony, then these lists of names get um, burned and that happened right there in the room. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the things we wouldn't do here, probably. Mm -hmm. But, um, so it was quite, um, yeah, so it was a powerful, uh, powerful thing and, and very meaningful to be a part of it. And so it feels like over time, I think, just we see the increasing connection between sort of the, the Tibetan tradition and our way of assimilating here and you kind of see them coming together um, in more and more ways. So beautiful. Thank you. Any questions or comments? We have a bit of time for either on that or some question about practice you're sitting with. What's that? Oh, you got a third, your third reason appeared. Yes, my third reason is that I've become more skillful at doing it. Yeah, 
yay, that's that confidence piece. You know, I keep, um, ever since Lona Michael was talking about this so precisely, I keep coming back to relax body and mind, noticing when I'm off, bringing it back, rejoicing, and feeling the confidence. You know, like, oh, I can do that. As he pointed out, if you can do it one time, you can do it two, you can do it three. You know, if you do one good pole vault, <laughs> you now know how it goes. It doesn't mean every time you try it's going to be that good, but you know it, and you can repeat it. And that's just the uh, same with calm abiding every time. Notice mine's gone, bringing it back. Oh, good, I got it. I'm confident I know how. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is brief. Um, when you were talking about being in a, in a ritual that you don't understand all the words, it made me think of a long time ago sitting with Kathleen Benz, who's one of the people on three-year retreat now at such an event that had, it was like a three-day get ready for the actual empowerment thing. And she leaned over and she said, when you don't understand what they're saying, you listen with your heart. And I've always found that a helpful thing to remember. Yeah. You have a general practice question dovetails nicely with Heather's question earlier. Um, so we're having some changes. Can you put the mic right up sure, so we can hear sure. you? Thanks, um, good. So it dovetails nicely with Heather's question earlier about being present in the moment, not yeah. flying away. Um, when life changes are happening, or we can, I'm in a place now where I can foresee some big life changes coming down the line. And so when I sit quietly in practice, it's often very easy for that fantasy to spool out. You know, I can mm -hmm. see, you know, anticipate change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's very easy to, to get carried away. Um, and the advice to stay present in the body was, was very helpful. Is there anything else, you know, um, especially when it comes to anticipating the future that can be done to help stay present, stay anchored? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one time I was at this uh, this weekend of meditation with uh, Great Vow Monastery, which is just out in Klatskanai. And uh, Hogan Bay sat down, and the very first thing he said to us, we were all being quiet, and he said, in this booming voice, which kind of scared me, <laughs> He said, the past is gone. <laughs> the future has not happened. What is this? I mean, it was like, pow, <laughs> you know? So I've carried that occasionally when I'm really spinning out. The future is not here. You don't know what's gonna happen. One of the, the most fundamental sufferings of being humans is uncertainty. But it's also a way out of the suffering to realize that's our condition. An earthquake could start right now, and this building could fall down. I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm just saying, also, you could go home and there's a big check in the mail from your dead aunt who you hardly knew. We don't know what's going to happen. So it's, it's truly a waste of our precious time to spin those stories out. And it's really good to see that. I'm wasting my precious time. This may or may not happen. I mean, you know, even take a very common thing. You plan a party and you, you kind of go, oh, that person will come and they'll do this and we'll eat that and we'll, the music will be like this. Has any party ever come off like that in your whole life? 
no. <laughs> no. It's full of moments and surprises. That's our life. So all this planning, the future is not here. Of course, it's good in a practical way to have kind of an outline. Like tomorrow, I have a few things on the calendar. But I hold them like, might happen, might not. Because, you know, I have an appointment with a couple people. They might get sick, I might get sick. There might be a two-hour traffic jam. <laughs> we don't know. And then if we live closer to reality, the reality of impermanence and uncertainty, then we don't add to our suffering of, oh, it didn't happen just how I wanted it. <laughs> we can just let that go. Okay? So you can just hear Hogan. <laughs> Hogan's <laughs> voice. The past is gone. <laughs> the future has not happened. What is this? Gosh, I don't know. Maybe I should pay attention. <laughs> So I love that he did that. <laughs> OK, we're at time. That past is all gone. <laughs> Don't know what's going to happen the next minute. We hope we're going to dedicate. <laughs> my this virtue, may I quickly realize Mahabhudra and establish all beings without exception in this state. Thank you so much, and have a good week of practice on and off the cushion. See you tonight, or see you